Corn School on RealAgriculture.com is brought to you by Distinct Herbicide and Pride Seeds. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Corn School. Uh, in recent weeks, we've heard a lot of discussion about the emergence of BT-resistant corn rootworm in Ontario, and uh, we're going to dig into that, to that today with my guest, uh, Tracy Bowdy, Mafra's entomologist. Tracy, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day here. Uh, we're harvesting corn, but obviously we've got some issues we need to tackle. And uh, I want to uh, kick this off with a look at this situation. And again, we've heard reports of BT-resistant corn rootworm turning up in some fields. What are we seeing? How widespread is it? Yeah, so um, we, you know, in the past five years, I'd say in Ontario, we've seen isolated cases. The, the odd field with failures or at least unexpected injury. And and in these cases, nowadays, there's usually two BT proteins in them. But this year in particular, in 2020, there have been multiple cases, um, some fields cross from each other, but um, multiple areas of failures. And also with different combinations of the BT rootworm proteins, which tells us that we're likely seeing some cross resistance going on. So we know um, for sure there's about four counties that have had incidences, but we suspect that those are just the ones that went noticed. Um, there's likely more that have gone unnoticed so far. So any high risk areas with continuous corn acres and repeated BT rootworm use, uh, hybrid use is likely at risk. Mm. So what could this look like in three years if it's, if, if, if it's left unchecked? Yeah, so interesting. This kind of snapshot we're seeing now is very similar to what the U.S. started experiencing in about 2013. And by 2016, they were reporting widespread uh, issues. So here's our chance right now to get ahead of this and not be like them. Um, so currently, sure, we may be in more isolated, high-risk areas, but if we don't mitigate these resistant populations now, it will become widespread in, in the province because the resistant alleles will always be there in the population now, and we just need to constantly keep rootworm at bay so that there's not a number of or abundance of resistant individuals out there causing injury. Mm. If we do start to see more widespread, then um, especially the silage and feed produce, um, livestock producers for feed and silage will start to see um, significant yield losses and, and shortages in feed. Mm. Now, we've used you know, primarily four BT proteins um, to successfully control this, this pest. Um, yeah. uh, what's happening here? Why are they breaking down? Yes. Yeah, so when we first had these uh, cry proteins registered, there was one, uh, cry 3BB1. So most of the hybrids out there were single traits. Then these other additional cries, which you said four of them, um, were um, introduced into the marketplace. Then they started combining them within hybrids to what we call now pyramid hybrids, meaning that they, it contains two cry proteins that target the same pest, in this case, rootworm. However, those three of the four are very closely related. So once the rootworm has been exposed and able to tolerate one, it can tolerate at least three of them, the others, even though they weren't ever introduced to them. So even if you switch to a different pyramid hybrid that has a different combo of those three or four cry proteins, um, they're likely to able, to able to tolerate one or maybe both mm. in that hybrid. So... What does this do to that? You know, the traditional thought we have of multiple modes of action, stacking those high those those proteins together. What does that do to that as a management strategy? It's gone, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so even if you haven't had the cases this year, it's coming because as soon as we've seen that that tolerance start to happen, if repeated use of those cries continue, they can develop resistance in two or three years. And now, especially if there's still maybe one of those cry proteins out of the four that's still working, that means that that hybrid is a single trait mm. hybrid now. It's not a pyramid. And so these rootworm can develop resistance more quickly because they've only got to um, overcome one more mode of action. Yeah, so the, cl the clock is ticking on that as well, right? 
Absolutely, yeah. So, so that's talk- where we've got to change the strategy up. Yeah. So let's talk, let's talk about strategy. You know, um, if if those BTs are, are compromised, are we back to rotation again? Yes, that is the number one. It's always been the best option to manage rootworm. Period. Out of anything else, and this is the most important thing to do in the next two years to really knock back this rootworm population so there's fewer resistant individuals out there to continue this going forward. So we've got to do our best in um, rotating. Corn corn rootworm needs corn. The larva cannot survive without corn roots being placed into the field that the eggs were placed the previous year. So if we don't put corn in it, they die. And so you can imagine if, if across the landscape, especially in these high risk areas, if a, a majority of them switch out of corn for a couple of years, we will see serious demolishing of these populations and really help us reset and start more sustainable practices in the future to, to manage rootworm. Now, some of the solutions you're talking about as well is getting creative. You talk about land swapping, different farmers yes. land swapping. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so there are that already does happen. Um, a lot of times, livestock producers just don't have enough acreage to um, produce the, the amount of feed that they need, so they go and borrow or um, and plant into one of their neighbors' fields. Now, that will only work if they're actually utilizing a field that's in a three-year crop rotation, so that and it hasn't been in corn the previous year, so that that way they can put it into what I'd say is a virgin field that won't have rootworm, and then they won't even have to rely on a BT rootworm hybrid to be planted in that field to get their corn crop. So that's an option. And and there are other feed sources that we can, or alternative feed crops that they could uh, move to in the next two years. We're not saying that they just have to source their feed elsewhere. Um, There are cereal crops that can um, give a similar energy uh, source to the the feed. Uh, It just requires them to be able to plant and harvest cereals. Mm. Now, if, if, if rotation is impossible, obviously if some yes. people are locked in, what options yeah. do they have? I mean, can they plant a, a, a pyramid hybrid? What about a non-BT hybrid with some insecticide? What about those options? Right. So my preference is that they would plant a non-BT rootworm hybrid. So anything that's just above ground only for, let's say, western mean cutworm or corn borer, they could utilize those because then the rootworm are not being exposed to the BT rootworm proteins again. It's keeping that out of the system. But those hybrids will then need to have some root protection. It could be soil applied insecticides. They're registered. They're, they work well in, in protecting the roots. Or they can also turn to high rate uh, seed treatment, the, the Neonex, um, as protection. We are currently working to see if MACP can understand the situation and help make it a bit more accessible for growers that are in this situation. Um, so at least to give them the, the option of being able to, to move away from BT rootworm hybrids the next two years. The other option is to plant a BT rootworm hybrid, and that's my less favorable option. Um, if they do use that, I certainly don't want them to use soil applied insecticide or seed treatments on that because those in combination delay rootworm emergence even further. And it actually increases the risk of resistance happening because only the survivors come out late in the season to mate with each other, where all the susceptible ones were much earlier in the season and, and um, mated and did their thing then. So, again, we try and encourage, yes, if you're going to use a pyramid trait, a hybrid, use one that you haven't used before, but also look for injury, report injury if you see it, and make efforts to rotate the next year completely out of corn um, because, again, you're just um, – you're enabling the, the, the rootworm population to um, be exposed to the BT proteins and, and continue developing resistance to them. A couple of final points. Um, is, um, is biocontrol a possibility here? You know, we're hearing a lot of reports out of some work on some work out of Cornell University. Yes. So Cornell, um, Elson Shields from Cornell has been working on um, biocontrol nematodes. They're native soil, very similar to what we'd use for grubs in our lawns, for example. Um, He has figured out a combination of two species that are really persistent. So you apply them once and his his research over the last 10 years, they're still working. They haven't um, died off yet. 
So once you apply them, you can apply them either in the manure or um, via spray sprayer. And the second year they finally kick in to really knock back the population. And I prefer this option because um, going back to the soil applied insecticides and seed treatments, they only protect the root from the rootworm feeding. It doesn't kill the rootworm population. So we're continuing that population to keep going. Whereas with Elson's work, he's using this in failure fields in the States and seeing that you can still use the BT rootworm hybrids in combination with the nematodes and it knocks back the population enough mm. that those hybrids can still function. Um, they get um, they get their yield back up in two or three years time and it just stays there. And it's a sustainable, sustainable, mm. there we go, rootworm management option. Um, and it's about $50 an acre. Yeah. So once we get that here and they, it, we can get them shipped here in Ontario without even needing a permit, which is, that's that's yeah. pro, um, promising. So that's yeah. good. Um, so that's where we we know we can't supply all of our needs this coming year, but we are willing and interested in doing demo demo sites at um, problem fields to show their uh, proof of concept and start that process of moving to using these biocontrol nematodes for rootworm management. Hmm. Hey, final thought, and that is a um, wrapping up harvest here. As farmers go in and, and start managing, uh, sorry, planning for 2021, what should they be thinking about from from a corn rootworm resistance perspective? Yeah. So now that we've developed cross resistance, we know it's here. Um, we really have to stop using just BT rootworm hybrids as the the main go to for rootworm protection or rootworm um, control. It's just not going to work for us anymore. So now we have to rein that back. Only use these hybrids in their higher risk years, um, and use crop rotation to knock back the rootworm population, so that you can enable at least two. Um, years of corn production before the third year when you really do need to use um, BT rootworm hybrids again. So we've got to change our thinking on how we um, continue forward because now it's going to either um, develop resistance widespread or we can rein it back so we can still use these um, hybrids when we need them. Hey, Tracy, um, some great insights. Thanks for joining me on the Corn School. Great. Thanks for having me.